Well, Dan Ellsberg has made a number of truly incomparable contributions. First major one was the Pentagon releasing the Pentagon Papers. The other one, in his view, and with some justice, I think even more significant, is uh, unveiling the nature of the planning for nuclear war and the significance of what it entails. The doomsday machine goes back to the planning in the 1950s when he was on the inside of the system, had direct highest level uh, access to the major uh, information. But what he discovered was utterly shocking. I mean, part of it was the uh, the uh, uh, the very fact that the psyops, the major uh, the planning documents, uh, when you when what he reveals about them is utterly appalling. I mean, down to details. First of all, the the doomsday machine that he uh, basically explained and unveiled is the system that both the United States and Russia have developed, which guarantees essentially total destruction if anything goes wrong. Well, there are systems in place which are just going to destroy everything if the normal modes of communication interaction are disrupted or broken. He discovered the, by practice, the by his own experiences, the delegation and subdelegation of authority to launch nuclear wars. He found that the Eisenhower administration had officially delegated to lower officials the authority to launch a nuclear war in case the Central Command in Washington was disabled. But he found even more than what was in the documents just by his own travel to near contested areas, he discovered that lower-level military officials basically had interpreted instructions in such a way that they could uh, initiate uh, nuclear bombing that was later supported by soldiers who were, in fact, flying the Air, Air Force uh, personnel who were flying the advanced missions like the so-called chrome dome missions during the Cuba uh, missile conflict when U.S. planes were in the air all over the world, B-52s and others. And some of the pilots had pretty much interpreted the instructions to mean that one or two of them could launch nuclear weapons. Uh, the dangers that were uh, discovered then Ellsberg discovered in his the materials he was reading that if, for example, there was a conflict in Berlin, the U.S. nuclear system command could then target hundreds of major targets in China, which had nothing to do with it, and destroy China over an altercation in in Berlin. All kinds of things like this. It's utterly hair-raising when you go through it. And the net effect is uh, his conclusion. We just have to get rid of these monstrous systems, nuclear weapons, or else there's no hope for us. Of course, it's very difficult to put measures on these matters, but uh, release of the Pentagon Papers substantially uh, increased the dedication of large parts of the population to bring an end to the war. That affected Congress. Congress began to contemplate and pass resolutions, or come close to passing resolutions, which would call for uh, terminating the war after a certain point. The Nixon-Kissinger administration did everything they could to ban these. One of the devices that they used was to plan periodic uh, small withdrawals of U.S. troops to make other steps that looked like de-escalation to try to tame down the popular opposition and the congressional opposition. A lot of this is discussed in 
extensive detail in a very serious, uh, careful work that just appeared in Carolyn Eisenberg's uh, study of the Nixon-Kissinger administration based on uh, extensive use of newly available uh, internal documentary material that will be the standard work on this, but it shows how Nixon and Kissinger were consistently trying to balance their attempts to escalate and maintain the war against the growing protest and from all over, from popular forces, from wives of POWs and um, Congress. And the Pentagon Papers stimulated this protest by revealing just how much uh, deceit was involved in uh, carrying the war through in the 1960s, I should say. Personally, my own major interest in the Pentagon Papers was the early years, the early 1950s, the detailed record of careful, systematic planning that laid the basis for the long-term engagement, very rational imperial planning. I've written about it and we'll go through it again, but the major impact that it had on the public was the deception and the misrepresentation that was leading to deeper engagement in the uh, Indochina catastrophe, not just Vietnam, but Laos and Cambodia were wrecked at the same time. Uh, one of the things that Dan himself emphasized in his, when he was bringing this to the public, 1969, 1970, was the failure, total failure to pay attention to what this would mean for the victims. He kept asking pointed questions. He actually prepared, a, at Kissinger's request, he prepared a set of questions to be asked internally to the top-level planners. One of them was, how, what's the cost going to be to the Vietnamese, the Laotians, the Cambodians? Nobody wanted to discuss this. Dan went public with it, wrote articles about it, uh, and made it very clear that these are considerations which are at the top of our concern. What are we doing to the victims of our crimes? That and um, altogether, the, it just helped significantly educate activists, general public, who were organizing to try to put an end to the horrors. Well, one of the effects, this relates specifically to the question about using nukes. One of these effects was huge demonstrations in Washington, then argued plausibly that the Nixon administration was considering the possible use of nuclear weapons in uh, in, at a period of crisis for their policies in Vietnam, uh, and that this was deterred, canceled, by the huge uh, demonstrations in Washington that took place at about the same time. Since then, more information has come out that supports his uh, uh, analysis of this. So I think there's fair reason to believe that uh, Nixon, Kissinger, might have moved on to nuclear weapons had it not been for the enormous protests and the their uh, refraction in uh, congressional action. Can't prove it, but it's a credible case. There's no question that... Uh, what Eisenhower warned us about in his last speech as president, the military-industrial complex, or as he was planning to call it, the military-industrial congressional academic uh, complex, has been a very significant fact in impelling policy. Is it profits for the arms industry? I'm not sure I would... I'm not sure I think that that's the main factor. The industry itself, first of all, remember that the military complex is not just uh, building tanks. Major industries 
are involved substantially in developing military systems. Uh, advanced, all of advanced technology is used pretty directly for military purposes. So all of its uh, producers are uh, directly involved or di directly or indirectly involved in the armaments industry. This includes the financial institutions. The banks are lending the money and making profit from it and so on. So the whole complex is a very large part of the industrial system. And of course, the profits and uh, uh, for the and growth for the industrial system and the those who own it is an essential factor in policy formation. So it's not just making money by selling tanks. It's the whole complex uh, system of interacts which reaches out to all aspects of the ind industrial and financial uh, complex, basically the core of the uh, productive economy, uh, that its uh, uh, success is doubtless uh, the dominant factor in policy formation. So if you think about the whole system, yes, it's not just profits for arms industry, it's a far more intricate and complex system. And it's right up to the present. Uh, the, uh, in fact, as technology is advanced, uh, uh, computer technology, uh, semiconductors, and so on, the uh, involvement in production of advanced armaments has extended very widely through the entire system, and it surely remains a factor in uh, determining the commitment to war and conflict. Dan has argued forcefully that ICBMs are a severe danger to the United States and produce no military advantage. I think this is confirmed by broader, by military analysts quite generally. Uh, the reason is pretty straightforward. These are fixed position armaments. An adversary, say Russia, knows exactly where the IBMs are located. The satellites have pinpointed their positions, which means ICBMs are therefore what are called in the lingo a use them or lose them armaments. If you don't use them right away, you're going to lose them because uh, if, if there is a sign of conflict anywhere and it turns out to be real and you didn't use your ICBMs, they're going to be knocked out. And that means that the anything anywhere near them will be totally destroyed and devastated. Uh, uh, it also, uh, they add basically nothing to the uh, capacity to deter or to attack and the so-called triad, they're one part of it, but uh, submarines, which are pretty near undetectable, uh, bombers, which uh, are not quite that undetectable, but are in the air all the time, they can carry out so much destruction that anything additional that could do be IC ICBMs is essentially undetectable. The, nuclear submarines, like a single, it's reported, I don't know the details, that a single Trident submarine, single one, uh, can uh, destroy about 200 cities anywhere in the world. And they're being replaced by more advanced uh, Virginia-class submarines, which can do even more damage. And they're pretty much undetectable. So that alone provides vastly more capacity than could ever be imaginably used for any sane purpose. The ICBMs add nothing to this. Why do we keep them? Well, the Pentagon was smart enough to deploy them in rural areas around the country where there is very limited economy. So you have an IBM installation in some 
rural area. Uh, they're a major part of the local economy. The local congressional representatives want to keep them there. So there's a lot of congressional pressure to maintain a system which is an extreme danger to us and provides nothing uh, for any military purpose, even granted, and I'm assuming it for this discussion, that there's some legitimacy to the military purposes. I don't think we should accept that, but we're assuming it for this discussion. This is one of the great mysteries that one has to ponder when reading work like Dan's Doomsday Machine or his many uh, efforts to try to bring the nature of these systems to understanding. Yes, they're understood, but nevertheless, elites talk about it as if it's a realistic possibility. We see this right now. Uh, just recently, some high military official, I've forgotten his name, uh, said that he predicts that there'll be a war with China in 2025. What does a war with China mean? It means say goodbye to each other. There's nothing left. A war with China is not to uh, shoot a couple missiles in the South China Sea. No, oh, it grows to a war in which everything is destroyed. Not certainly, but very likely. Uh, people talk, congressional people talk loosely about uh, 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 the nuclear weapons in the Ukrainian war. Start using even low-yield nuclear weapons pretty quickly escalates up the ladder. Any war game shows that. Just common sense shows how it would happen. You're basically finished. You cannot, one of the lessons that Dad has been trying to drive home for half a century is you just cannot casually talk about these options. It means virtual termination. Actually, uh, He's not the only one to warn. Uh, shortly before his death, uh, Albert Einstein was asked uh, what weapons did he think would be used in the Third World War. He said, I don't know what weapons will be used in the Third World War, but in the Fourth World War, they'll be using stone axes. Well, that's basically the story. Any survivors will be back to the earliest stages of humans or proto-humans. So the question you ask is, how can this happen? How can elites ponder this and not do anything about it? Actually, that question arises considerably more broadly. Let's take the other uh, major uh, imminent threat to human survival in any decent form, the environmental crisis. Take a look at the fossil fuel industries, say ExxonMobil. We now know quite a lot about their reasoning and thinking for the last 50 years. Back in the 1970s, ExxonMobil scientists were in the lead in analyzing and predicting the effects of climate destruction from the use of fossil fuels. Information right went right to the top levels of management. They filed it away. Company secrets we don't want to talk about. Finally, in 1988, famous geoscientist James Hansen gave a public testimony, which was widely reported, couldn't hide it anymore. They called in their top PR representatives and asked, how, how should we deal with this? Well, they decided not to deny it. To deny it, you immediately be refuted. What you should do is just uh, raise questions about confidence. 
how certain are we that this is going to happen? Well, it's science, so you're never certain. There are always variables you haven't looked at, haven't figured out how cloud covers work. Maybe there are some spots, sunspots on the moon, on the sun. Uh, so let's just delay, and meanwhile, uh, become a richer society uh, by maximally using fossil fuels. Of course, we become richer corporations that way. Uh, well, that worked very well. It meant we lost many years, in which we could have been dealing with the climate crisis. Now it's much harder to do it. Going back to what's in their minds, they knew this all the time. So what is in the mind of a CEO who says, well, let's destroy the world as quickly as possible because I can make more profit tomorrow. I think we can guess what's in their mind. What's in their mind is, if I don't do it, somebody else will do it. If I don't play this game, I'll be out of business. It's called capitalism. If I don't play the game of maximizing profit, next guy will push me out and he'll be worse than I. I just add that because I know I'm a nice guy. So the best thing to do is just keep trying to destroy the world as fast as possible. It's kind of like an institutional mania built into the institutional structure of systems geared towards profit-making without concern for the human consequences. Deep institutional malady. And if you think that through and you try to put yourself in the position of the people who are thinking about that, probably that's what they're thinking. Same with the uh, planners, the arms makers. As far as they're concerned, well, we're, we're keeping the peace. If we don't do it, worse people do it, then there'll be a major war. It's pretty easy to construct rationalizations. We all know that from our own experience. And these are rationalizations which, like all, have a thread of credibility, no matter how insane they are. I mean, I should say there are cases which Dad has unearthed in which he just can't think of an answer. Well, there was one, there's one case, I don't remember the details, where some top general was asked something about uh, how many people die in the next nuclear war. He said, maybe only a handful, but we have to make sure they're Americans. I don't know how you answer that. <laughs>